Now, this is one of the hardest topics in art history to really deal with online because ideas such as feminism require a certain amount of discussion. And on occasion, people will want to get into more of a debate, which YouTube does not necessarily lend itself to. So keep in mind, what I'm presenting is one view, but there are numerous views and there are lots of discussions that can well take place surrounding these ideas. So we're not getting as much of that on YouTube, but uh, buckle in, it's still going to be an interesting ride. So feminists point out that throughout most of recorded history, males have imposed patriarchal, in other words, father-centered social systems in which they have dominated females. Although it's not the goal of this chapter to recount the development of feminist theory in full, the history of feminist art cannot be understood apart from it. Feminist theory, for example, must take into account the circumstances of most women's lives as mothers, household workers, and caregivers. In addition to the pervasive misconception that women are genetically inferior to men, feminist art notes that significant in the dominant, meaning especially Western cultures, patriarchal heritage is the preponderance of art made by males and for male audiences, sometimes transgressing against females. Men have maintained a studio system, which tends to exclude women from training as artists, a gallery system that has kept them from exhibiting and selling their work, as well as from being collected by museums, albeit somewhat less in recent years than before. So, where does that leave us? Well, we end up with feminist art that is trying to draw our attention to these inequalities. The idea is not that the art will suddenly fix the inequality, it's that the art will start a conversation and you'll look inside yourself and say, wow, how am I unequal? And then that's going to start in a conversation. Even if it's an internal dialogue, it is still a conversation. Now, here is a notice posted by the Gorilla Girls, founded in 1985. This is a group of artists, writers, and performers who fight discrimination. But they create a list that they publish in 1989 known as the advantages of being a woman artist. And here we see working without the pressure of success not having to be in shows with men, having an escape from the art world in your four freelance jobs, knowing your career might pick up after you're 80, and it goes on from there. The idea here is to call out the art world, to say, look, you are saying that you're interested in these feminist ideas, but you're not really going to map for us. You're not really changing anything. Feminist art history must be considered as part of this discussion. Its proponents have demanded that women's arts from all cultures, all periods, be included in the studies and exhibitions of art. But arguably, we haven't gotten there yet, because if we had, we wouldn't need to look at uh, classes such as female artists of the Renaissance or women in art. The ultimate endpoint would be dealing with women in art with everyone else in art. We would have a pluralistic view of art history. So instead of focusing on uh, primarily white men, we would look at women, we would look at minorities, we would look at everyone more or less equally, something more similar to a global art history course. But in 1971, Linda Nochlin, very, very famous, writer wrote a landmark article titled, Why Have There Been No Great Woman Artists? Giving tremendous momentum to feminist scholarship concerning women in the arts. We also see numerous histories of women artists being published in the 1970s and several others have appeared in the years since. One of the most famous is going to be Whitney Chadwick, for example, uh, with a book entitled Women in Art. Very simple title, very complex ideas that she's setting forth. Now, before the late 1960s, most women artists were struggling to participate in a male-dominated art world, and they had overwhelming 
disincentives to put feminist meanings into their work. They actually sought to degender their work. Oftentimes, they're working under a male at some level in the studio system, in the workshop. And that male, usually the master artist or whomever, is the one who's signing all of their pieces. So there's no putting gender into it. That's what we'll see from a lot of pieces. The bow tapestry is almost certainly created by women, but we don't talk about it in those terms. We talk about in terms of the male history behind it, just as one example. Often on the basis of appearance alone, their work could not be identified as woman-made. We also see several countercultural movements that arise simultaneously with feminism in the 1960s. And at the same time as feminism is rising, we see the civil rights movement, the Vietnam War, economic prosperity, the arrival of oral contraceptives, reforms in the Catholic Church, Vatican II being uh, more specific there, nostalgia for the presidency of JFK, and experimental experimentation with psychotropic drugs. Many other countries will experience massive social unrest of various kinds. We're going to see near war in the Eastern European countries as some of those try and revolt against Soviet occupation. Some gender issues have been of interest to both male and female artists. And although female art has arisen more from the concern of artists of one gender, some of those concerns are sexual in nature. More often than not, feminist issues have been about women's power in the arenas in which sexuality, either reproductive acts and roles, is an important part. So feminist art poses or confronts very specific questions. First, how is a woman's gaze different than a man's? How does the difference influence the ways in which the two genders view the world? And how do they view art? So the idea of the gaze is that your general audience, for example, for art, is generally considered to be male. But if you have a female artist, how are they going to approach a painting? Are they going to look at something the same way? Is something that speaks to a male gaze going to speak to a female gaze? And this is especially important Today, when we deal with movies, it's been a very big issue, whether something is created for the male or female gaze. They also ask questions such as, what constitutes obscenity and pornography? Where do they, these ideas come from? What are their results? And are, there always, are they always transgressive? So what is appropriate and what is obscene. And what they're getting at there is the double standard in art. For example, I can show breasts, I can show butts. Heck, in art, we love penises. There are penises everywhere. But if you show a vulva, you're going to find yourself in a world of hurt. And they're looking at that double standard and they're trying to fight back against it. Now, Although feminist artists have shown great interest in the depiction of nude figures, both male and female, very few feminist artists have shown interest in creating erotic work. So we don't see uh, you know, nudes full of eroticism coming from feminist art. And that may have a lot to do with the idea of the male gaze. Now, some other things they're looking at, they're looking at women in history, trying to remind us of major women in history who are frequently forgotten. They're looking at the role of women in reproduction, both the pain and pleasure of reproduction and of birth. They're looking at the double standard of what can be shown on a male body and what can be shown from a female body. They're looking at issues of the gaze, issues of Imagery, for example, there's a shorthand for a penis that you can see drawn in a bathroom stall, but there is no shorthand for female anatomy. So a lot of different ideas going on here, and these artists will take all sorts of different routes to get there. The commonality is that we're usually dealing with some issue of female inequality with all of these pieces.